Good evening. Welcome to the second 2019 AVID event. I'm Tim Hickman, past president of the Des Moines Public Library Foundation Board of Directors. I do, I told Tim up, more volume. Okay, is that better? Okay. I'm Tim Hicken, Hickman, in case you missed that. <laughs> up? Okay. Oh, and now I can hear myself. So since 2001, there have been 139 AVID events attended by 47,499 people. That's impressive. <laughs> I wondered how many of you, so this is my first year where I've committed to read every book before every lecture. I'm up, I've read both, I'm, and I've read three out of six, so I think I'm gonna get it done. How many people are committed to do that in the audience tonight? Hey. <laughs> so we'll hold each other accountable. I mean, there's, there's a group of them. There are very loyal audiences for AVID. AVID would not be possible without input from the Volunteer Selection Committee, the leadership of Tim Pollock, and the entire community engagement team Thanks to the outstanding staff at all locations of the Des Moines Public Library. Thank you. That staff provides our community with free, relevant, and important resources that are transforming lives every day. The Des Moines Public Library Foundation and Executive Director Dory Bryles raised funds for AVID, summer reading and school readiness, programming for children, teens, and adults, new public access computers, and other library needs. Um, before I, I have to do some very logistical things, but I do want to say it's a real honor for me to be able to be involved in tonight's presentation. I started reading this book, Lori Frankel's book, and I thought, this book is going to teach me something, which, you know, that's kind of good. It, and it did teach me something, but in the best possible ways, through a really wonderful family, and living with them, it is fabulous. So I'm super excited to hear more from Lori. Bringing outstanding authors for AVID, offering program services in the latest technology, and improving the library's collection takes more money than the tax dollars can deliver. So I hope you will consider going out to the check-in desk. There are these lovely white envelopes. And if you would like to get a lovely white envelope and put some donation in it and put it in the basket, it will allow us to continue offering these programs. Programs like this are offered around the country, but they are seldom free. And we are absolutely committed to keeping this programming free to all the residents of the city of Des Moines. So a few other logistics. You will have a small piece like this for your questions, and you also have a blue form. We really want to tailor these programs to fit your desires. If there are authors you want to be considered, please fill out this review form. It gives us really valuable information to make sure that the programming fits your desires and needs. Also, Purchase, purchase a book from Beaverdale Books. You can have it signed after the lecture. Beaverdale Books is a very generous and donates part of their proceeds back to the Library Foundation and is really our only independent bookstore in Des Moines. Please support them. Thank you to the volunteers and sponsors that made this possible. Our premier sponsor is the Des Moines Register, Nationwide Foundation, Principal Financial Group, Brad and Kelly Edminster, Humanities Iowa, which is a state-based affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Cultivating Compassion, the Dr. Richard Deming Foundation, Mary Kelly and Daniel M. Kelly Family Foundation, O'Brien Fitzpatrick Foundation, Karen Schaff and Stephen Jane, Dr. Catherine and Andrew Hauser, Pam Bass Bookie and Harry Bookie, Shelley and Martin Brody, Mary Ritchie, Douglas and Deborah West, Dawn Taylor, Judy Blank, Marianne and Robert Sobiak, and finally, 
If any of you are interested, um, I'm forming the in first branch of the Sue Woody fan club. <laughs> so if you want to join, just let me know. Um, but I get to introduce Sue Woody. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's been less than a year, but we've had Sue Woody as the director of the Des Moines Public Libraries for less than a year, and she's transforming our library system. She is generous. She's really dedicated to the community. She is a local Des Moines gem. So please help me in welcoming Sue Woody. Good evening, I'm Sue Woody. Thank you for coming to this very special AVID event. Lori Frankel's third novel, This Is How It Always Is, elegantly tells the story about a family who navigate the challenges and questions that arise when its youngest son decides that he is a girl. Claude becomes Poppy, and we all, we readers, we fall in love with Poppy as she grows up and she carves out her own place in the world. This is such an intimate family story, and it's told at a very critical time for our society. This book made me laugh, it made me cry, but most importantly, it really made me contemplate what it means to be a parent and what it means to advocate for your child. This novel is a work of fiction, but it was inspired by Lori's own life as she herself is a mother to a transgender daughter, now age 10. This Is How It Always Is was a New York Times bestseller and one of Amazon's best books of 2017. Also one of the best books of the year by People Magazine, who called it the most sensitively and sincerely told story of 2017. Last fall, Reese Witherspoon chose This Is How It Always Is for her popular Hello Sunshine book club, saying at the time, Every once in a while, I read a book that opens my eyes in a way I never expected. I feel the same way. You'll get a chance to ask your questions on the little forms Tim showed you, and give those to a volunteer after Lori's talk, and we'll get them to David Shivers. David Shivers is going to be our moderator for this evening's event. He's the former Des Moines Register publisher and president, and he's also the proud father of a transgender son and a cisgender daughter. But now, please join me in welcoming Lori Frankel to the stage. Hi, y'all. Can you hear me? Yes, people, no, you can't hear me? But it's weird. Um, I, I know you think that's easy, right? Um, how's that? Uh, yes, sure, because I'm shorter than everyone else. You're not wrong. Um, I can do the handheld if it's easier. Okay. Listen, I can do anything. I could actually probably talk loud enough. I'm very loud. Yes? Better? Look at that. Um, oh, this is better anyway, because I, I, uh, I taught for many years, and I'm very used to walking around while I do these things. It's difficult for me to, uh, you know, just like stand in one place. Um, I, because I'm antsy, I guess. Um, but I can, I can see that this is echoing. Is this good? Can you hear me? Do you, you feel great about it? No, you can't hear me? I'm out of ideas. Okay, it's the people in the back can hear me. See, you think that you sit in the front and they're the best seats, but no, it turns out, no. Okay, okay. all right. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. I am so happy to see you all here. Um, I can't tell you how heartening it is to look out and see a room full of people at a library who've, who've come to a library event. One of the things that people have said to me and had to say to me over and over over the course of this book is now more than ever. And I have mixed feelings about it as regards the book, but that's what I think when I look at all of you. Like, this is what we need right now in the world is people who read books and come to the library. I'm so thrilled to see you all. 
I mean, yes, lots of applause, hardcore. It's, it's, wonder, it's amazing. Um, and, it's, and I've done this a lot. I've done this all over the country. And many rooms are less full than this one. So that's really quite something. Um, and, and not to be underestimated, you all are readers. I'm a reader, too. I'm going to talk to you about my book, because that's what you've asked me to do. But I would also talk to you about any other books. All of the books you're reading, we could talk about all the books I'm reading all night long. Um, I'm always happy to talk about, about books, um, writing them and reading them. And you know we can do that during Q&A. Um, I'm very glad that you are here. And I'm very glad to be here. Um, this is my first time in Iowa. And, and it's really amazing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I came in yesterday. And I flew in from Minneapolis on a very little airplane. <laughs> and, um, and there was a thunderstorm. It was very turbulent. It was, it was not that enjoyable. And while that was happening, I was watching the flight attendants, as one does, to see whether they were panicking. They were not. I was. They were fine. And, and I was thinking, like, these are people who are trained to save my life in the event of an air disaster, which, let's admit, has to be like the worst kind of disaster. <laughs> Right? Um, as far as disasters go. And that is a very difficult job. And yet they spend most of, most of their time, you know, asking me what I want to drink and handing it to me in a little cup. And that contrast is really astonishing to me. Um, if they're lucky, that's all they do, right? They, one hopes, fingers really crossed, especially those of us who are about to get back on a little tiny airplane tomorrow, that, that that's, you know, that that's what happens. Um, that flight attendants never have to use that training. And I'm watching these people and thinking, that's what my job is like. Which, let me tell you, my job is nothing like that. I would be terrible in a disaster. So let's hope tonight goes well. But what does strike me is that contrast, is that people who are trained to save your life in the event of an air disaster, but mostly spend their time you know, helping you get on an airplane and offering you a soda, I spend most of my job with my butt in a chair writing a book. It takes days and weeks and months and years of just sitting there. And, and it's lots of hours and it's lots of time. Do you want me to go over there? No, it's good. OK. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, they want you to go out into the world and sell the book. And those things are opposite. Um, they want you to engage on social media. They want you to um, go places and meet people. And then, like, look, I had to put on heels. <laughs> I, I mean, I go like weeks without even putting on pants because I work in my house. I do usually, you know, put on at least like yoga pants to walk the dog. But that's not the same thing. Um, and you know, you write online. At least I do. Um, I'm, you know, I'm connected to the internet. And so you have to be the kind of person who can ignore the social media and all of the emails that come in and not check the news all of the time and not care what your friends are doing because you got to sit there and put your butt in the chair and write a book and then they want you to go out and engage on social media and those things are are opposites and that's a very interesting contrast it is and and therefore it means that I'm pretty well suited to half of my job and pretty poorly suited to the other half and that the better I am at one half of my job less well-suited I am to the other half. And I know people who, who, who do both things. Um, that is, I know lots of people who are really, really good at social media and screwing around online, but they're not really good at writing novels. Uh, and so, you know, you, you sort of, you, you pick your demon, I guess, in this way. Um, in the case of this particular novel, um, we knew going in that it was going to be a little bit of a different ball game than, than usual. Um, I had to be talked off the ledge of, I can't let this book out into the world. And that's when I got the now more than ever lectures from my, from my people. When I started the book, I did not know it was about a transgender child. And uh, well, when I started having a child, I did not know that that child was going to be transgender. Um, when those two things came together and, and turned out both to be the case, then I freaked out and said, never mind, I changed my mind. I can't, we can't let this book out, out into the world. I, I can't do it. And my agent said, that's why we need this book, um, because of the things that you're scared of. That's why you need to, to tell this story, which is the sort of thing that you know, agents say to you. Um, and, and what she said was, we are going to 
uh, so I'm, this is my third book. My second book, we sold at auction. You know, we had all of these publishers and all of these bidders, and we bid them against each other, and the agents do what they do. I stayed home and didn't wear pants, actually. Um, in fact, I have a... These are the things that come out of your mouth while you're on book tour that I never planned to say. Um, I have a picture of my kid who was at the time like two, having a naked car wash. She's wearing a car at the time. Um, she's, na you know, uh, and that was from that that day. While my agent is fielding offers and all of this such, and you know, and then it went to the high bidder. Um, this book we offered to one person, and she said, "I don't have time to take this book on right now." And we said, "Well, wait." And that also is the opposite of, of the way this thing usually goes down and the way that it usually happens. And we picked her because we knew that she was going to be able to say no to all of the things that I wasn't going to want to do, that I was going to be able to draw a line wherever I was comfortable and that they were going to respect that. And as an aside, they have been amazing. They've been really fantastic. One of the things that happened, frankly, coincidentally, the book came out three days after the presidential inauguration. And one of the first things that happened um, from this administration was a threat to roll back a number of protections that had always been in place. People Magazine had just reviewed the book, and so I was on their mind. And so they called, and what they wanted to do was send a reporter to my house and do a big spread, as they do in, in People Magazine, and interview me and interview my kid and take a lot of pictures. Um, you know, and, 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 talk about, and talk about the book and talk about, you know, our opinions on things and, and all of this such. Um, and this is the kind of thing <laughs> that book publishers like get down on their knees with gratitude for in three days after the book has come out. That is the kind of publicity that they and I dream of. And uh, they said no. And I said no. And, um, and that is a, that has been the, the hallmark of this, of this experience in many ways, their willingness to have, to have my back on this um, and their understanding about my need to protect my kid and her privacy now and, and in the future. Um, that is, you know, from the internet and, uh, you know, and what she's going to want people to know 10 years from now and 20 years from now and who she's going to be. And these are not things, these are not things that we know. Um, and one of the th ways they wanted me to do that was they said, write the 1500 words of your story that you do feel comfortable sharing. And we'll get that published, placed somewhere. And then we can just point anyone who asks questions to that and say, this is what she's willing to share. We're not doing pictures. We're not doing photographs. We're not doing names. We're not answering any questions beyond these questions. This is the information. And I said, OK, I can't, you know, I can't tell her story because you know, that's her story to tell. But I can, I can give you 1,500 words, like a page and a half, of, of my story. Um, and, I, and I wrote the story of sending my kid to the first day of first grade with a with a male name, apparently male name, and a male pronoun on all of her forms in a dress. And um, calling the, in fact, I emailed the, the first grade teacher the night before school started and said, I hate to be that parent who's already <laughs> bugging you before school has even started, but I thought you might want a heads up. This kid who looks like this on your, on your roll is, you know, is, is going to come like this to school. And it was terrifying. And it was the first thing that was terrifying for us because, you know, her, her hanging out at home in a dress did not phase me. Um, her hanging out at the grocery store in a dress did not phase me. Her going to friends' houses in a dress did not phase me. School is a different thing. And I knew it was going to be a different thing. So I wrote 1,500 words about this. And we, um, they, they, they placed it in the New York Times, which runs a column called Modern Love, a very popular column. And they were very pleased <laughs> with that placement. And they thought it was going to be great. And this is in September 2016. Um, so like six months before the book came out, four and a half months before the book came out, um, six weeks before the presidential election. And um, it, runs, it runs in the Sunday New York Times. But it posts on Friday, which I found out on the West Coast, because I opened my inbox. And all of these people who'd been awake for many, many hours before I was took that opportunity to email me all sorts of hate mail and, indeed, death threats against me and against my kid and against my husband. There was a whole thread about his manliness that he thought was really funny. And it, with, some, with some distance, I see the humor. I did not at the time. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, and, and, then I, and then I checked social media as they were wanting me to do, and as I had been studiously avoiding doing, that I might get this book written. Um, now the book is written, and they would like you to engage. And I got on and found a great many people with whom it was uh, not possible to engage. 
Um, or at least not desirable and probably not. I don't know because I didn't try, but I'm pretty sure um, they were not engageable. Um, there were a lot of there were a lot of emails with the subject heading, I bet you are a Jew. There were a lot of emails with um, the subject heading, uh, have fun in the emergency room with your kid. And, and they were all addressed like, dear Laurie, and then they, they kind of went on from there. And, and that is a, I mean, in addition to the way that's sort of like on the face of it disturbing, it's also a very strange thing to happen. Um, you know, in the lead up to publication, and but one of the things that happened as a result is that this publisher that had all along been very supportive was now very surprised uh, and, and not a little taken aback. Um, and they had this, you know, this tour planned for me that was, so I live in Seattle, which is, you know, up and down the, the coast, and they thought, okay, well, you know, that's probably fine. And then it also went all through the south. It was uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas. It was the rest of that tour. And, um, you know, and they were kind of concerned, but we thought, like, you know, okay, it'll, it'll be all right. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there was this presidential election, which went away that, best I can tell, no one anywhere thought was going to happen. And, and so then they start to have this conversation, like, do we need to send you with security on book tour? And that's a really astonishing question to ask, just on the just on the face of it. Uh, you know, we didn't know, and we thought, no, no, that's probably an overreaction, and, you know, kind of geared up for it. One of the weird things that happens about book tour, and one of the reasons why I love events like this so much, is, like, some of you have actually read the book, which is really wonderful, and the rest of you, I know, we're going to go home and start it, like, tonight, which is also really wonderful. Um, you know, when you go on book tour, the book has just come out. I, I went the next day, so... No one, no one has read the book, and we really did not know what to expect. And we were sort of, you know, we were geared up for the fight. Um, we were ready to, we were ready to do battle to the to the extent that you can get ready to do battle, um, which is which is probably itself fairly limited. And I was, I I did maybe my third event was in a bookstore, an independent bookstore in South Carolina. Um, I did my spiel. I turned it over to Q and A. First hand up, which someday I will learn not to call on the first hand up. <laughs> But it was not that day. Um, and you think I would have learned that one, but no, I did not. And so I called on her, and, and she stands up so that I could hear her, and she said, are you a Jew? And I thought, uh, you know, here we go. And in fact, what I thought was, bring it on. Let's, let's do this thing. Uh, and I, you know, I, I had this moment of like, I, I don't know how to answer that question, but indeed I'm Jewish, so I, you know, I went with the truth because it seemed like the easiest path forward. And I said, yes. And she said, is that why there's an orange on the cover of your book? And I said, whatever do you mean? And, you know, and I had this moment where I was like, oh, you're not evil, you're just crazy. <laughs> but no, no, <laughs> uh, neither, it turned out. She said, she told me this story that I had never heard before about how feminist Jews put an orange on their Passover Seder plate. And she thought maybe that was why there was an orange on the cover. Now, I had nothing to do with the cover of this book. I mean, not, like I didn't even name myself, obviously. That, that's, that's down to my parents. I did not title this book. That's down to my publisher. Uh, I, did not, I did not pick an orange for the cover. In fact, when they showed me the cover, I said, there aren't any oranges in the book. Do you want me to write some in? <laughs> um, you know, because because I had nothing I had nothing to do with it. But what I learned in that really wonderful moment was um, that I had been afraid, and that that was ungenerous, particularly um, because first of all I know better, and second of all, m much of the point of the book is exactly is exactly that. Don't 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 be afraid. The afraid is is not helping you. The afraid is not getting you anywhere. Um, in fact, what is true is that people who read books and people who come to library events and people who come to bookstore events are lovely, open-minded, tolerant people who are not sending you threats via email. Um, and and in fact, I, I, went on this, I went on this large tour, I met all sorts of people, and not a single person, not one, came up and yelled at me in person. Which means if you were planning on doing it, you can't, because look, I have a streak going. So if, you're, if your plan for tonight was like to come up and yell at me after this, you, you gotta change your plan. Um, because, and it's not, it's not, of course, because everyone who goes to bookstores or libraries agrees with me, obviously. Um, though, of course, I am, you know, often right about all things. 
It's because people who read books are willing to ask the questions. Um, people who read books are willing to to hear to hear about lives that are not like their own, um, and in fact, demand it. That's why you read books is to live lives that that are not your life. You know, many times it's because you you can't or would rather not, you know, live that life. Um, you know, think again, Sam. It's because of this plane that I'm into disaster novels at the moment. But you know, you think of all these disaster novels. You don't yourself want to experience a disaster. But you know, it's nice to think about how it might feel to be in an earthquake now and again, or you know, whatever it is. Um, and you know, and and in a and in a in a sort of more broad sense, um, it is a question of empathy. It is a question of having someone ask you questions and helping you think about what would I do and, and how would I feel. I am probably, because I am a, a teacher by, by trade and no doubt inclination, much more interested in asking the questions than in answering them. Um, but I also think it is the much more interesting way to go. It's what I want when I read and therefore, I, think, I assume, it is, what, it is what I am looking for. Um, you know, when I, when I am writing as well, it does not seem to me to be an interesting question. Will you love your child unconditionally? I, I just think the answer to that is both obvious and, and boring. I think that yes or no questions are almost always obvious and boring. And, and I think that that one in particular is, you know, sort of a no brainer. Like, of course you're gonna, of course you're gonna love your kid. I think a much more interesting question is how? How are, how are you gonna love and support your kid? And sometimes the answer to that is, is obvious, and frequently, very frequently, in, for lots of ways, for lots of reasons, the answer to that is really mysterious. That's what the book is about. Never mind, I did not choose the title. That is what the title is about. Um, that was my pitch for this book. That was um, what I wanted to, from it going in. It is why I went in not certain that the kid was going to be transgender or that the transgender kid was going to be the focus of the book. Because really, the book is about the ways that this is how it always is, even though most parents will not have a transgender child. Because most parents will have a child who is sometimes gender nonconforming. And all parents will have a child who is sometimes not conforming, period. And, and that is true for all of us. Sometimes, I mean, what I am always saying to people in, at events like this is, your kids are weird. And they always think like, oh, you know my child, but no. <laughs> it's just that all kids are weird. And, um, and sometimes, and, and really this is, this is part of the, this is part of the, um, I'm going to go with wonder of parenting, but it's also certainly part of the trauma of parenting, is that just when you get your head around whatever it is, whatever it is changes and becomes something else, it is not a skill that can be mastered. Um, it, 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 that, isn't, that isn't how it works. And therefore, this question of, um, you know, of how, how you're going to support the kid is, was something that I thought was very interesting, like, you know, book-like interesting. Um, the other thing that I was thinking on the, on the plane on the way out here uh, was a thing you probably have noticed, which is I was in the middle <laughs> of the country. <laughs> which, I don't know how much you think about it since you live here. You know, I live on the edge and I'm trying to think, do I think about being on a coast very much? I don't know that I do. I think about, I mean, so one of the things is that um, as I've been wandering around here, people keep saying to me, oh, it's north. And I think, well, I don't know which way north is because there are no oceans. <laughs> The nice thing about oceans is that then you know which way is, you know, which way is which way. <laughs> um, without that, I, you know, it's very, it's very puzzling to me. I, I live in Seattle. My parents live in Maryland. I grew up in Maryland. I went to school in Virginia. I went to graduate school in Delaware. You know, I've, I've been on both coasts. I haven't been in the middle. Um, and it's a much, it's a, listen, it's a much shorter flight. It's much more pleasant um, to, you know, to not have to get on an airplane all day long, uh, you know, in order to, in order to go somewhere. And, um, and that makes you, and and that makes you in the middle. You know, you will also have noticed that that uh, I was in the middle in 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 that other way that we say the middle too, like um, like the fray. You're in the fray. You're in the middle of things um, because there's so much political stuff that happens here, and the time off from the political stuff is getting smaller and smaller and, and smaller. You'll have no doubt noticed this. And on the one hand, it's really exciting because it's exciting to be in the middle. And on the other hand, it's really, really hard to be in the middle. 
And it's the other thing that this book is about for me, is the challenge of the middle way, the challenge of finding some place that is in between. It sounds like the answer to lots of problems, and yet it is a very difficult place to be. It's exciting, and it is conveniently located. And I'm sure if you live here, you learn the difference between East and West based on some other landmark. It's very clever of you. Um, but <laughs> it's not... Um, it's not, it's not comfortable, it is not easy. The thing that drew me to this topic to begin with, at the, at the very beginning, the very seed of it for me, was that question of how. Uh, so many of the issues that are in, let's call it the national discourse at the moment, are very polarized. In fact, the discourse itself is very polarized. People disagree wildly. You believe what you believe, and you think that the other side is crazy and possibly evil, and there's nothing they could say that could, that could convince you that they were right, and vice versa. There is no middle. There is no middle ground there. And that's too bad in the first place because it doesn't leave a lot of possibility for compromise. But in the second place, and more importantly, because it doesn't leave a lot of room for conversation. It means we're not talking. We're not, we're not having a conversation. What I thought was so interesting about this topic at the beginning, what drew me to it, was that though I did not think it was interesting to say, okay, so imagine you have a transgender child. Are you going to support that child or kick that child out of the house? I, it, it's not that people don't kick that child out of the house. I didn't want to put any more of it into the world than there already is, and I didn't think there was a story there. I don't think there's anything else to say about that. What I thought was really interesting was that having two parents both show up and say, great, we're on board, we've got our heads around this, we understand what this is, of course we love you, of course we want to support you, could come down on completely opposite sides of the question of how. And that is interesting. Um, and that both of those sides could be reasonable and loving, that you could be in one position and not think that the people who disagree with you and on the other side of this are crazy and evil. Um, but in fact, just have a slightly different opinion than you on a thing that they don't understand either because, because nobody understands it, what it is to, to live somebody else's life completely. And that made it to me, an interesting and, and important question. Um, it is what led me to The Middle Way. I know that not all of you have read this book, and I don't want to spoil, spoil it for you, but the third part goes to Thailand, which you might find surprising because I myself found it very surprising. Um, and I was two-thirds of the way through writing this book when I got to the end of part two and typed, she agreed to go to Thailand. And then I stopped and thought, oh, no. I cannot finish this book because I have never been to Thailand. I had been thinking they would do a nice cross-country road trip. They go back to Wisconsin, and I've been to Wisconsin, so that'd be great. Um, I probably would have driven through Iowa on the way there. No, I guess not quite. Okay, never you mind. But I would have, maybe I would have detoured if I had known how lovely you all were. I definitely would have. Um, you know, in any case, that, like, that seemed like a great idea to me. And, and then, you know, like, no, no, it, 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 that didn't work. It, it had to be Thailand. And... Um, and so then I, you know, I looked at people's like vacation photos on Google, and I, I put that little guy in in Google Maps who will, you know, street view who like why well, wandered around Bangkok with my little avatar and you know peeked into places. I went to a Thai restaurant up the street from my house and like you know ordered some pad Thai and like smelled it and wrote down some adjectives. I thought like you know I mean I made the whole book up. It's all pretend. Like you know it's fiction. I can make it up. And then I called a travel agent the next day and said, yeah, I, I need to go to Thailand. And she said, great. What do you want to see? And I said. I don't know, Thailand, <laughs> completely, completely clueless. Um, and I said, also, I, I, you know, I need to go next week. I can't, I can't finish this book without going to Thailand. Um, what I did say to her was I also, what, the one thing I knew I needed to see was a clinic. I needed to see a border clinic. She said, they're closed, you, you know, to tourists. I mean, of course they are. You can't, like, go wander around. Um, so we had to get government permission, in fact, to, to do that. And then I flew halfway around the world, which is commitment <laughs> to your job. Um, and a weird business trip. It is strange to travel with people you have made up. Um, but nonetheless, that is, that is, speaking of crazy, right? Um, that is what I did anyway. And, um, and it was for that reason. It was because I was very keen to get to the end of this book and, and not have it be the end. I wanted it to be the middle. It is hard to find the middle at the end of your book because that is one of the things that is, that is hard about the middle. It is, it is hard to stay there. I really wanted to end this book without answering the question 
I wanted to end without saying, you know, and then he went back to being a boy and lived happily ever after, or and then she, she was a girl forever and she knew she always would be, and that was the answer, and everybody was sure, and it was great. I wanted to end in the middle. This is a really difficult thing to do in English because we do not have a gender neutral pronoun that we are comfortable using for people. You know, like we have it, which is great if you're talking about computers, but it doesn't or objects, chairs, you know, go by it. Um, people don't go, go by it. That's changing, that language is evolving. Um, so I think that, that that particular problem will go away. Myself, I solved it for a little while by writing it in the first person, and then nobody could talk about this child. Then I started writing it in the second person, like you. That was super annoying. Um, so that had to go. There was a lot of finding my way through this book. I. I cut 250,000 words from this book in order to find my way from the beginning to the end of it. Um, and I went halfway around the world to, to Thailand because that, that was the way that, it, that was the way home for me. That was the way to figure out how to talk about, how to be in this place in the middle is to talk about, is to talk about Buddhism and to talk about the middle way. It is, just as an aside, really funny when you reply to people who have emailed you with the subject heading, are you a Jew, when you say, well, actually, I've become a Buddhist. They think, oh, that's not actually better. <laughs> that was in the beginning when I thought replying to these emails was a good idea. Then I learned it was not a good idea. <clears throat> it takes some time sometimes. Um, and, you know, and so I think um, I'm mindful of the time because, uh, because one of the things that I have, have found over the course of things is that if I if I leave room for questions, you will ask them, and, and you should. I think it's really nice that you got little cards to to do that to do that with. I was um, while you were filling them out. That my see, I just I, I sell you all these things that I don't plan on telling you. My kid just started sex ed this week, you know, at school, and they have them, um, and that's what they do. You know, they fill out the little cards so that they don't have to. You know, and she came home and said, "Why don't we just raise our hand and ask?" And I said, "Oh, well, some people are embarrassed." And she said, "Why?" And it's like. Yes, it says so much about you, darling, that you don't, like, not only are you not embarrassed, but you don't even know why anyone would be embarrassed. Um, but that's what, that's what these cards remind me of. You can ask me embarrassing questions, but probably I have been asked them before. Um, don't necessarily take that as a challenge. In any case, um, <clears throat> see, I'm trying to wrap up here, and I had like 18 other things that I thought that I wanted to say. What I wanted to, what I wanted to end by saying is the middle where you all are is a difficult place to be, but I also think it is the only good place to be, um, because it is in the place where we are asking the questions. It's not, it's not about you agreeing with everything I think. Um, it's not about you agreeing with everything everyone else thinks. It's about having this conversation. It's about having a dialogue. I think that one of the difficulties of one or the other, of pick this box or this box, of there is no in between, and we are not even interested in hearing about the other side, is that we aren't having a conversation. But that's what books do. Books are all about asking the questions. They don't, they don't answer them. They're not supposed to. That's not their job. What they do is, is ask them. And, um, and that, I think, is where, is where you all are. In, because I was in the middle, but also because you were in this room right now. This is the way of libraries. Um, this is the way of having an independent bookstore that you're supporting. Um, and, and this is the way of, of starting books that you think, I don't know if I'm going to like this book, and finishing books and thinking, I don't know if I like that book. Those are my favorite books. Um, because those are the books where you are, um, have been asked to go someplace that you didn't want to go, and, and you went there anyway, and, and you lived that life for a little while, and you asked those questions. Um, and, and that is the place where I think we all want to be. So congratulations on finding yourself there. And thank you very much for having me. I'm so sad to get, thankful to be here. Thank you. And, oh, we're going to do this. Yeah, we're going to do Q&A, um, and then, well, and then, and you all can, you can do whatever, you can ask me whatever you want. Um, you've got things to say about the, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, then I'll shut up. I should, though, say, I, you know, I fit in all the things I long to say to you by talking really, really quickly. <laughs> Um, so if it is too fast, you just like wave at me and say, I have no idea what you're saying because you said it too quickly and I'll try to say it again more slowly. Okay. It's not my best thing. And I talk really slow, so it'll be, it'll be great. It'll be good. Um, uh, thank you all, first of all, for coming again. Uh, this is a really uh, important topic and a uh, really interesting conversation. Uh, I'm David Shivers. I'm the former president and publisher of the Des Moines Register. Thanks for the intro earlier, Sue. 
Um, not only am I the former president and publisher of the Des Moines Register, I'm also a Des Moines native. My, my wife, Teresa, is here uh, as well. She's a Des Moines native. And we grew up with the public library as a central part of how we were exposed to the world. So the work that uh, the library does is extremely personally important to me uh, and our family. And I just want to thank you all for supporting the library. And, and I think maybe one more round of applause before I go on would be great. Now, as Sue said, I'm also a proud parent of a transgender son. And so September 2016, uh, for me, uh, as you were doing your article, uh, was an important month for our family. My, my son, who was 13 at the time, uh, and I'll try not to get too choked up about this, um, uh, came out to us. And it was, uh, my wife and I like to describe ourselves as contingency planners and researchers. And this was one contingency, one scenario that as parents we just hadn't expected. We thought about sexuality, we thought about all sorts of, you know, strange sorts of things that could happen, but uh, the question of uh, gender nonconformity uh, and gender dysphoria was just not on our radar. So uh, we were very happy to discover this book, and uh, it was actually sometime in January or February uh, of 2017 when the hardcover had come out that I walked into my son's room, uh, you know, 13 at the time, and he had this beautiful orange book on his uh, nightstand. And I asked him about it. I said, oh, what's this book? And he told me that uh, one of his friends, who has since come out as gender nonconforming, but it took, her, uh, took them two years to do so, uh, had bought the book, read it, given it to him, he read the book, and then I asked him if I could read it, then my wife read it, then we loaned it to friends, my wife did it for her book club, uh, and the story's gone on and on from there, and when I found out that you were actually coming, I was so thrilled uh, to you know, talk to you, uh, get the community at large reading about this topic, reading this book, and uh, I'm just really so glad you're here, Lori. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question uh, because that's what I get to do as moderator. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, but what, you know, it's a two-part question again because I get that liberty as a moderator. First is, what did you hope would happen with the book? And then second, what were some of the most touching pieces or a very touching piece of feedback that you received as you went out into the community to talk about the book? Yeah. You know, you always hope that everyone will read the book, like everyone, every, every person in the country and other countries <laughs> should read the book <laughs> and buy like several copies. That's what you want, right? Um, in this case, you know, when I, when it, when it all sort of started coming together and I started to realize what the book was about and I started to realize what was going on in my household, um, what I also realized was this was my opportunity to invent the world that I want my kid to live in that I want her to grow up in, that I have a very small ability to make that world happen by making it up and making it compelling and convincing. So that, that was my hope. I also think that much of the conversation surrounding this issue um, at the moment in this country is dishonest, disingenuous, perhaps. There's a lot of talk of uh, violence and um, and 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 it isn't fair and it isn't true and so I wanted to talk about that too um, as I was saying I it's not that there aren't issues here it's not that there aren't discussions to be had there are absolutely but they're not the ones that we're having and so that concerned me and that was an, a thing that I thought oh no I can I can speak to this I can I can talk about this um, so that was part of it I have and I'm going to answer the rest of this question by I guess answering the second part of it which is which is the thing I should have said when I said you know I have this huge inbox full of hate mail that was true but it was shouted down in volume and in number by the people who wrote to say thank you I thought I was the only one which is amazing, by people who wrote to say, my childhood was not like this, and I'm really happy it is gonna be different for, for your kid, and 
and um, you know, in that in that generation, um, I heard from a lot of parents who said, "My kid doesn't have that. My kid has this other thing. <laughs> uh, my kid isn't like that. My kid is this other way." Um, and this really helped me, you know, work through that and think about that. I had a lot of people, a lot of people who email me and email me still to say, "I was, I didn't realize I was on the wrong side of this." And thanks for helping me. And I, you know, and it just, I mean you want to sit down and cheer, you know? Um, and in fact, I want to invite them over for soup and be like, let me tell you some other things that I think. <laughs> um, which you're, you're really not allowed to do. That's great. Um, okay, I'm going to start asking some questions from the audience. Yes. Has your daughter read the book? Uh, and if not, will she? she? So I'm sure she will because she reads everything, but she's only 10, so she hasn't read it yet. Um, and she certainly didn't read it when it came out, which was, I don't know, that math eludes me, but it's been... I guess it's been two and a half years. So she was much younger. Um, you know, I think it's not that, um, I don't think she would, I mean, she certainly wouldn't be offended. She has the idea that it's about her, which it really is not. Um, she thinks that everything should be about her because she's 10. Um, and so I think she would at the moment be what I hope she will eventually be the opposite. But right now I think she'd be disturbed about how little it's actually, you know, about her. Um, mostly I think she'd be bored. I. It's not boring. It's super engaging. You're going to love it. <laughs> because you are not 10. Um, but, you know, I think it's a little, it's a little adult for her at, sure. at the moment. Um, I do, I, I'm sure she will read it someday. She's, you know, because she reads everything. And, um, and I think she will see, it. she will get in a way that, that no one else has how thoroughly it is made up. Um, it's really not about her at all uh not least because she what i was about to say she's really boring she's not really boring she's terrifically fascinating as she would tell you herself but her story is really boring and she's so lucky to have that and she doesn't realize it she doesn't she doesn't know that and and that's what you would wish for her right like a, a boring life that she doesn't she doesn't know how lucky she is um and that's amazing it's it's wonderful um but it, it would have made a really you know, boring story. I mean, I sent that email out to her, to her first grade teacher, that super apologetic, I, I'm looking forward to meeting you, but I think you should know about. You know, what I assured her was, this is not something that we've undertaken lightly, because I didn't want her to think, like, I was, you know, like, that it was on a whim. I don't know. You know, I didn't even know what I was thinking about. I was curled on the ball on the floor, freaking out, as you do. Um, and she emailed me back, about three minutes later, bless her, and said, oh, I had a trans kid in my class last year. I, I'd been through gender training. I know all about this. Um, and maybe it's that, and maybe it isn't, but just know that we'll support your kid no matter what, and it'll be fine. And that's, I mean, that was a, that was a minor miracle. It was a really, really wonderful thing, and we were so, so lucky. Um, you know, she, she goes to the public school that is that we are districted to, so this was nothing but luck. Um, they go around, they sit in a circle on the first day of school, and they go around and they, they say their name and, and what they did over summer vacation and their pronouns. They, they come up with this as, as normal. So that's awesome, but it's not a lot of plot there. So then the plot had to get made up. That's great. Yeah, and I think you all, I heard, we were talking earlier today and you said that, you know, there's a GSA, a, a gay-straight yeah. alliance, yeah. In the elementary, the elementary school, yeah. which is pretty incredible. It's, it is. It's a little weird. But it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Which character in your book uh, do you most relate to? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to it. You know, they become real people for me. So that's the other way, I suppose, in which they diverge from my kid, who's also a real person, of course, but uh, um, in many ways less knowable because, you know, other people are mysterious to you. You never really know what's going on in another person's head, especially a 10-year-old. Um, and these people, I know everything that's going on in their head because I own them. I made them up. They are my people. Um, so you get very close with them. I think that when other people read my books, um, people who know me, they identify me with one of the characters much more than, than I do. They feel very different to me because they feel like, pretty fully realized people. Um, you know, I have some things in common with the mother in this book, <laughs> obviously. Um, among other things, her worries and anxieties are mine. And part of what happens in book writing is you're playing out the nightmares, um, as well as the dreams. And so that certainly happened in, in this book, and they're hers and they're mine. 
she's a doctor and I knew I was going to need her to be a doctor going in because I was going to need somebody to explain all this medical stuff to the reader. But I, I am like the opposite of a doctor. I am not, as I said at the beginning, I am not good in a disaster. Blood is not my strong suit. So, um, so I'm very different than, than her in that way. And, and in fact, much of the research that had to happen in this book was, was that because I don't know what I was talking about. And, um, and in that way, you know, of course, I'm much more like the father, not in attitude, but, you know, he's a writer and, and I'm a writer. So pretty healthy mix of both. I set out to switch the gender stereotypes for the two of them as much as possible. So, you know, she's the breadwinner and she's the scientist and she's the doctor and he's the stay-at-home dad and he's an artist, he doesn't make any money and, you know, all this stuff. Um, but that only went so far because will I or no, she was the mother and, and he was the dad and there was nothing I could do about that. Sure, sure. Um, next question here. How would you like to see schools supporting transgender youth? Oh gosh, this, here is a conversation we could have for an hour. Um, you know, as I said, I'm very, very grateful to my kids' school. Um, and in, in lots of ways, um, Curricular, not least, they um, they have been really they have been really wonderful, and they are not accommodations that they are just making for for me and my kid. They um, this is just part of their this is part of their curriculum. This is part of their approach. They've been great, but but really, I think in many ways the answer to that question is to do as little as possible. Um, one of the things that elementary schools do best is accommodate kids' needs. Um, kids are really diverse in their needs and you know and in many ways that's the that is so much of um, what elementary school um, thought and and effort and uh, and and curriculum but also you know approach and and resources goes into that notion of accommodation trans kids don't need accommodation they they don't need their own bathroom they they don't you know and in fact probably you, you, you wouldn't you, you won't know there are very few elementary schools where they're you know like having kids pull their pants down on the way into the restroom if they were that's what you would be worried about um, you just kind of got to let these kids alone and let them do their own thing there are lots of ways in which the answer is less intervention rather than more intervention um, I will say though that that to the extent that they are picking books and picking guest speakers and doing things like going around on the first day and asking kids what their pronoun is, that's making the world better for everyone, not, not just trans kids. That isn't accommodating specific kids, that's just making the world a better place you know, for everybody. Um, and the extent to which they're linking this, so one of the things, for instance, in our school is that some of the trans curriculum has come tied in with the Black Lives Matter curriculum. And that's a good metaphor. That's a good, that's a good place to look at, um, you know, where these things cross over. That's, that's a good argument. And it's one that kids can understand. Um, and so I think that that's the kind of thing that, it, you, that, I, that I think doesn't even get called accommodation because it's, it's, it's more like educating. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I remember in the book, the, the dad, there's the conversation early on with um, the administrator of the school in Wisconsin, the, I forget what you called it, advocate, advocating for what, you know, <laughs> from the district, and uh, the, the teacher, and the dad just having this moment of sort of monologuing about, you know, isn't that what you want for every kid yeah. to be comfortable beyond sort of these restrictions that society puts on them? and uh, you know, that resonated really true with me, and, and I think it, more, it also illustrates, you know, the point that you were just making. Um, it's, it's not about transgender kids as much as it is about allowing for a spectrum of full expression uh, that every kid can feel comfortable and true in, and, and, and I really appreciate that message in this book. Um, next question, did you ever think of writing a more final ending, a more, I, and I... <laughs> Yes, as I said, I cut 250,000 words for this book. I have all sorts of endings for this book. Dozens, dozens of endings for this book. Um, I, I did, I did. Um, but I, as it went on, as I say, I was really, I did not want to answer the question. So this is also an email that I get all the time. People saying, what happened? I want to know what happens next. Um, part of the reason I did not answer that question is it's not an epilogue. It's, it's really another book. Um, you know, puberty is a, is a whole new ball game. And, and so it, it, couldn't, 
it couldn't get tacked on to the end. It, it would be a whole different thing. So then people say, well, you know, are you going to write a sequel? Um, which I don't think I am going to, although enough people have asked my publisher thinks, maybe, maybe you are. <laughs> um, I, I really wanted to hold that space of not knowing and that being OK, too, um, which is, as I say, a very difficult place to be in. But I think an important one, not, not just for you know, these kids, but for, but for all kids. Um, and you know, and it is helpful to me <laughs> to think about childhood as, you know, as a as a journey through a lot of a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both in the sometimes parenting is challenging, <laughs> and you know, and I think no, no, I can live with this for the week it's going to happen, and then it will become something else that maybe will be worse or maybe it will be better. Um, and you know, and I just think that that's a useful way to think about things. I think that the plans that we make and get wed to almost never work out. Um, and so flexibility is, and being in that middle place is a good thing. So, so the short answer is yes, I thought about it, but not, and in fact, I've drafted it out, but not very much because I really, really wanted from pretty early on to end the book without answering the question. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, this question, um, this question is from the audience as well. Do you have a Carmi in your life? It's this, uh, the, the person who asked this question said it's my favorite character of the book. The, the grandmother. Oh, yes. Um, that is a great question. So, in fact, that character appears in all of my books. Um, and I, this last one, I, I had drafted and sold, the one I'm working on right now, um, I had drafted and, and sold and didn't have that character in there. And then somehow when I was revising, she showed up. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, there you were all, all along. Um, I, I was very close with both of my grandmothers. And so that is, that is my explanation. A, a lot of people want to know if she's my mother. And indeed, my mother and my kid are very close with one another, with each other. Um, that is also true, but I think that character is, is my grandmother, perhaps a composite of, of both of my grandmothers. I was, I was very close. I was very close with both of them. That's great. So um, there's, I, I'm sure there's a few, not only are there a lot of readers in the audience, but I'm sure there's a few writers in the audience or aspiring writers. Could you talk a little bit about your writing process and how you go about uh, crafting, a, crafting a novel? Yes, I can. As you can see, as you will guess from my cuts folder, it is not linear. It's not a linear process. Um, I don't know what the book is about at the beginning, and I definitely don't know how it's going to end. And I realize things along the way that change everything that came before and that result in, um, in a lot of revision of, of the beginning because because I, didn't, because I didn't know it, because I didn't know it going in. Um, this one, I thought that fairy tale was gonna keep me grounded and on track, and I thought, oh, it'll be easy, and it'll help the reader follow along where we are, and, and it's, it'll be easy to write, because you know, it's like a fairy tale, how hard can that be? <laughs> and then I had to write, every time I changed something in the book, because you know, the fairy tale parallels the rest of the book, every time I changed something in the book, I had to change the rest of that fairy tale. It drove me insane. Um, I, I, it doesn't take me a long time, I write faster than most people I know. This one was about a year door to door. And, and that's pretty quick as, you know, for, for a novel. But it is, it is just a disastrous process. Mm -hmm. um, what I like about it is that at the beginning I have a, a, a word count. So I write it, when I'm drafting, I write a thousand words a day, at least. Always. If I come to the end of the chapter and I have written 998 words, I will write the first two words of the next chapter. I, I, I'm, wed, I'm wed to that. Um, but only on days that I can write, which is not every day because, because, I, have, you know, because I have a child um, and, and you know, book tour and, and all the things you have to do. Um, when I can write and when I'm drafting, I write a thousand words at least every day. And most of them are terrible and most of them are cut. But the beauty of that, that process is that when I get to the end of the day, it's no matter how bad they are, they're there. So I did what I needed to do. I can feel really good about myself and, and pleased and, and proud. Um, never mind, I'm going to go and, and, you know, and cut them later. And then when I'm revising, I don't, I don't have a rule about cutting a thousand words a day, but it looks more or less like that. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's a lot of cutting. Um, I, 
I start to know that it's working when the characters start to make their own decisions, when I'm not dictating what it is that they're doing. I start to know that it's working when I write books like I read them, where I'm surprised about what happens next, where something happens that I didn't see coming. Um, that, that, is a, that is a hint that it is working. You know, I sit down at the beginning of them each time and think like, I will outline this time, or make a diagram, I will, I will draw it out and, and it'll be great, but it's, it's just, it's not available to me. And in fact, um, my agent and my editor both begged me this time for, um, so in between that book and the one that I'm writing now, I wrote another book, which my agent really liked and my editor really did not. And so they said, could we see the first 50 pages? And I said, sure. But I, it turned out I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I can't write 50 good pages without, without writing to the end first. And I'm trying to explain this to them. And they, I mean, these are people who deal with writers for a living. And for their life, they could not understand that. <laughs> um, and yet I, I have to write to the end several times before the beginning starts to take shape. It is, it is unfortunate, it seems to me, that, it is, um, that that is the process. But, but, but it is. And, you know, and then mostly um, when my kid is not in the house, I write. And because she is home a lot, because school is brief, um, and because I got into this habit, you know, I wrote my first, much of my first novel when she was a baby. You know, you, you write when the baby sleeps. You um, pay $20 an hour for childcare, and you are not going to spend that time screwing around online. And, um, and then, you know, you think, oh, school, school will solve all of my problems. And they're like, oh, right, but let's make a list of the holidays and the half days, and we don't go to school on Wednesdays, and, you know, all of the things. Um, so if she's out of the house, I sit down and, and write. I'm very, I'm very diligent. I'm just not very linear. Yeah, that's great. Uh, this is the last question, and you can say, hey, look, I, that might be too personal. I don't want to answer it, but um, I'm going to ask it, and then you can do that. Um, how, you know, you mentioned this when you were talking before that you sort of had a panic moment when you were writing the book and you were like, I can't do this. Um, how long did it take from the time that, and maybe this wasn't linear either, but did you know your child was transgender before you started the novel? And if so, how long did it take you to digest as a parent what was going on to a point where you could as a writer, get some objectivity and some distance to actually write about the topic? Yeah, that's a good question and a hard question. It, I mean, the short answer is no, I didn't know. Um, one of the v very interesting things, particularly for parents of really, so my kid was really young um, when this went down. She's about five and a half. Um, one of the things that happens is that parents who are more, I don't know how I want to say this, upset about it at the beginning, notice more quickly. So in fact, you know, I remember having conversations with her, you know, like when she was learning to talk at like 18 months, where she was saying she wanted, she did not want to wear pants, she wanted to wear skirts. And, you know, I thought that was about like waistbands, because like, listen, pants are not comfortable. <laughs> Uh, and I thought, oh, well, we'll get you some sweatpants and it'll be fine, you know, because I didn't know. Um, and, you know, and, and she was always, she was very interested in, you know, in dolls and in, and in clothes um, and, in, and in playing dress up and in wearing dresses while she was playing dress up and, um, and in pink things and, you know, all of the stereotypical stuff, none of which set off any bells for me of any kind. I just... You know, I just, you know, I thought like, yeah, pink is awesome. I also love pink, you know? The it's, I mean, it's interesting because I have now met so many families and um, it is the parents who have the hardest time getting on board who, you know, who are frankly alarmed that their son once, you know, is always choosing pink things. So it was, I think, going on a lot, a lot longer than, than, I, than I knew. I also, at the beginning, wanted very much to say to her, if, if who you are is a boy who wears dresses, that's fine. And if, if people don't like it, then that's too bad for them. And because I didn't want to push her one way, you know, or the other way. Um, so all of that was happening. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, this is my job. So my brain was, was doing its thing. And I was doing a lot of, of research you know, by way of, you know, of parenting as you do, where you're thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm going to read this book, or I've come across this article that 
that I might otherwise have let go by that in fact I'm going to read because it applies to my life. And um, you know, the sort of nitty gritty of, of hormone blockers, I thought was a really, really interesting question. That's you know what I was saying before. I think there are really good arguments on lots of sides of that question. And, and that, that's when I started thinking, oh, this would be a really good, good thing to do. I was, I was wed to those five kids and a, you know, as wide a range as I could of, of how kids are weird um, going in. And so I wasn't sure who the focus was going to be or, or what was going to happen. Um, and so then things, you know, came together. Those two things came together slowly. It was, it was, not, it was not clear to me that um, the child was, that my child was going to be was going to be transgender for a really long time, even after, I think it would have been clear to other people, even after she started using the girls' bathroom and going by female pronouns. And, um, you know, and I, just, and I just didn't, what I did not want to say to her is like, well, you've started, so you got to go all the way. I wanted to say like, you can be in the middle, the, the middle will also, will also work. Um, and it was um, very keen to do that as slowly as I could in the book, which is also why it had to get cut a lot. Um, my agent kept saying, "I'm sure it is this way, but it's just very boring. <laughs> could could some plot? Could something happen?" Um, and you know, so that's so it had to get it had to get sped up. But I think in life, it is often a very slow process. This is one of the things we we're talking about this morning: is this this notion of coming out. Sometimes, sometimes applies, and and sometimes it's very different, particularly if you're five. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. Well, I want to thank you again, Lori, for for joining us. And uh, you know, Lori will be signing books outside the room. Books are available to uh, purchase, courtesy of Beaverdale Books. Uh, I know you all know Beaverdale Books. What a, it's a great little gem uh, in our town. Uh, thank you all for attending. Our next Avid event will be uh, on Monday, uh, April 22nd, featuring Chigozie uh, Obiyama. Go to uh, dmpl.org slash avid for more information on all of the upcoming uh, writers. And please remember, you have blue forms. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill that out, hand it to the volunteers or the information desk outside. Uh, and. We will take the programs if you'd like to recycle them. Again, thanks for coming, everybody. Mm -hmm.